Good morning, everybody. How's everyone this morning? Yeah, I like it. I like it. You know, um, this morning we're going to be in, in Mark chapter 12 again. We're going to be continuing our study of that, uh, verses 18 through 27. If you want to go ahead and start turning there, um, it's in page 848 in your uh, pew Bible. If you didn't bring one with, uh, you can take a look at that. Um, you know, this morning as we continue this, 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 this assault that Jesus is, is, is enduring, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit of, and, and just bring to remembrance some of the things that we've studied. If you remember correctly, at the beginning of, of the Gospel of, 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 of Mark, Jesus, at the beginning of his uh, public ministry, was taken by the Spirit out into the wilderness, and Satan himself started to test him and to tempt him. You remember that, you know, where he, he took him out there and he showed him all kinds of stuff. And, and if you recall, Jesus, the way in which Jesus combated that was with Scripture. You know, when, 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 when Satan said, hey, I've got all of, the th- you know, all of these cities, all of these things. You know, if you, just, if you just kneel down and worship me, I'll just give them all to you. And Jesus says, no, the word says, I will worship the Lord my God and only him. When he started talking about, hey, you know, uh, fix yourself something to eat, he did, oh, just, just go back and read it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And then, and then we've had the scribes, the Pharisees coming up, ch- testing him, testing his authority, testing all kinds of stuff. Here recently, he's, he's, he's come back to Jerusalem, you know, and we know why. We know why he's come back to die. He's come back to, to, to put a final blow to, to Satan's only position of power, which was death, that he had left. And he, he came back to do that. But before he did that, he had to confront the religious leaders. He had to, he had to confront them, and, and he'd been preparing his disciples, letting them know that, hey, you know, I'm going to go there, and this is what's going to happen. And if you remember when he was teaching them, okay, now listen, I want you to know how you're supposed to lead. You don't lead as a tyrant leads. You lead as a servant leads. And I believe that one of the reasons why he did that wasn't just because we could learn, but because he was about to assassinate, if you will. He was about to annihilate the Jew- Jewish leadership, the, 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 the religious leaders. They were going to be exposed for, for what they were and, and who they were. And today we're going we're to be picking that up again because, you know, last week Tom taught how they tried to get him, the Pharisees tried to get him with taxes and getting him and trapping him that way. And uh, then this week, we're going to be talking about the Sadducees. It's another group of the Sanhedrin. Do you all recall? The Sanhedrin was one of the most powerful religious organizations in, 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 in this area. So Jesus, again, just as a reminder, he's in front of the most powerful people in the most influential place, the temple. And this is where these folks decide that they're going to tag team. Y'all know, what a ta- y'all know how tag teams work, right? You know, it's this where you, you know, like relays, you know, where somebody's running and they tag, all that kind of stuff. You know, when I've done some, some training in, in the martial arts, and a lot of times when you're getting ready for something, they call it, you know, monkey in the middle, where you get stuck in the middle of the mat and then they just jump on you and they just one right after another after another. And the whole goal is for you to learn, but you to, to beat you down and all this other kinds of stuff. Well, this is, think about, think about this. I mean, you know, you talk about the level of deception that Satan has, the power he has to deceive. He's got these religious leaders thinking that if they tag team Jesus somehow or another, they're going to trap him. Somehow or another, they're going to they're make him crack under the pressure. or They're going to find some flaw in his theology. You know, and Jesus, he's like, well, you just ain't got it. You just ain't got it. You can bring it. Well, let's, I want to read, I want to read, starting in verse 18, the Sadducees here, when they come up. And he says, and the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child... The man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and then he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. 
Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For she had, for the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, is this, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. As you let that passage kind of settle in, you know, the songs, you know, the worship team does such a great job, and there were some phrases that stood out to me. Sweetly broken. It's somewhat of a paradoxical statement, isn't it? Sweetly broken. In awe of the cross, I love Jesus. I belong to him. These are all statements that as Christians we've heard, we've probably said, But do we live it? Do we live it out in our lives? Do do people see these things in our lives? How How is the world outside of Bayside, outside of this room right here, learning what it means to be sweetly broken? Oh, they know what it means to be broken. Suicide is rampant. Addictions are crazy going on. I mean, we, the people know what it means to be broken, but do they know what it means to be sweetly broken? What does it mean to be in awe of the cross? It grieves my heart when I when I talk to people and they don't know anything about who Jesus Christ is. I'm doing a study with a small group. It's a Chip Ingram study. Why I believe rethinking apologetics in the 21st century. And, and during one of his introductions, he, or during his introduction, he told of a story of uh, he was preaching at a church and on homosexuality and what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. And at the end of... At the end of the message, he said there's this sweet little girl, 15 years old, that comes up to him. And he says, he knows the family, good family, raised in the church kind of family, you know. And this little girl comes up to him and says, you know, Pastor Chip, I hear you. I hear what the Bible says about homosexuality. But if I have to tell my friend who is gay that they're wrong or give up my faith, I'm going to give up my faith. That's a pretty heavy statement. That's a pretty heavy statement that that a young 15-year-old girl would come up and say. You can't even imagine it, can you? Sweet sincere it's obvious that she didn't understand scripture or the power of God she didn't know what it meant that I'm going to love Jesus above all things and that and that the relationship with her friend didn't have to end Sadducees Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that as we go through and we learn about all of this, Father, that we would be able to find application. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that if we need to be convicted, that we're convicted. If parts of our life needs to change, Father, I pray that that would happen. 
If there needs to be affirmation, I pray for that as well. I've asked you this already, Lord, but I can say the words, but only you can change a heart. So, Lord, I submit to you, and I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we dive into this to this next test that you endured. Lord, help us to realize that we are talking to you right now as we learn about you. You did this. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, as we, as we continue with this tag team that, that, that Jesus is enduring, there's this new group of people, these Sadducees. This is the first time that Mark has brought up in his book in his gospel about the Sadducees. So I want to teach you a little bit about who they are. Now, granted, we don't. We don't have a tremendous amount of information about this particular group. It, it seems that they, along with the Pharisees, came up around the same time, and that would have been during the Maccabean Revolt. Now, I would love to spend some time right now and teach you about the Maccabean Revolt, but we don't have time for that. You know, but it's, it's cool. So I would go and, and, and look at that. This would have been around the 2nd century, uh, early 2nd century in B.C. And uh, then they were also wealthy, wealthy aristocrats and would have made up of most of the chief priest positions. James Edwards of the Pillar of New Testament commentary writes that they belonged to the highest social stratum of Jewish society. And Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, writes about them that they were men of wealth and men of rank. So these were wealthy people. These were aristocrats within society. Uh, they, would have, uh, they, they would have certainly had, had um, dominated the Jewish life generally, and particularly they would have been dominating in the Sanhedrin. Because they were so closely aligned with the chief priests being mostly of the chief priests, they would have intermixed with the politics a lot. And they collaborated with the Roman rulers a lot. Some, some differences they had is, uh, from the Pharisees is they did not believe in the resurrection, as was just stated. They didn't believe in divine sovereignty, and they affirmed human free will alone. The Sadducees' sole source of authority was the Pentateuch, or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. The first five books. And in that, they were expert in that. They were, they were, you know, they were, they really knew it because that's all that they used. The Pharisees, by, by and the difference between the Pharisees and them is the Pharisees believed in the whole of the Old Testament, writings, the prophets, and all of that. The Pharisees would have been considered, considered a theological progressive. Y'all love that word. How about the Sadducees would have been considered a theological liberal? We got out, you know, I just, just lighten it up a little bit. But that's, that's, what, that's what they were. Uh, and, and so we, we got we to we understand a little bit this. In, in our text today, we find the Sadducees confronting Jesus in an attempt to discredit the doctrine of resurrection and also to discredit Jesus. Okay, because, because if you think about it, Jesus, over the last, we've learned, I think it's 831, 931, and, and in chapter 10, Jesus has affirmed that he is going to go, he's going to die, and he's going to right, raise again. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, so there was this strong disagreement between the two. So if the Sadducees, you think about this, if the Sadducees could get Jesus to balk on the doctrine of resurrection, they got him. Not only do they have him, but they got these other yahoos that they serve with, you know, these, these, these Pharisees, these other folks that, that think they know, but they don't really know, you know, they, they, you know so they could have won on, on, on many different levels. So this is, this is their goal, you know, is to, is to completely discredit Jesus and, and what he has said. So, so with that in mind, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what they, at what they, what they say. They, they concoct this incredible scenario. You know, I, I mean, I kind of like the Sadducees, you know, because I do this sometimes. You know, it's like I'll just make up some little wild story, and it's just, let, let's just read it. I think, I think you're going to see what I'm talking about. So, teacher, isn't it also amazing this false flattery that they throw at Jesus all the time? You know, teacher. They didn't think of him as a teacher. 
Moses wrote for us that if a man dies, a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. We're going to get into that, but that's called a Leverite marriage. There's actually Jewish law that supports that. But here's the story. All right, so, so they start with this Jewish law, just to kind of set up the, the position here and what's going on. So, so here, well-known Jewish law. Now, here we go. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died in the resurrection, When they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Again, this may seem like this crazy idea to us in our culture, but again, the the, the practice of marrying a brother's wife was 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 uh, common back there. You know, it was it, it was it was something that they needed to do, and the reason that they did it was to to continue the family name, and also so that any possessions, any wealth, you know, fields, and all that kind of stuff would stay in the family. Because remember, in those days, a woman couldn't own anything. She had to have a husband in order for her husband to have all of these things. Y'all with me on that? So there's some examples of this I want to talk about. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. Genesis 38, 8. And then in Ruth, y'all know the story of Ruth and and Boaz, where Ruth and Naomi came came over there, and and Ruth ended up getting married to Boaz. He was the near kinsman. Y'all know the story? Y'all know what I'm talking about? That That would have been a Leverite marriage. By the way, Leverite comes from the word lever, which is Latin for brother's brother's uh, husband or husband's brother. So, so anyway, so I want to read just, just so you know this, this, this one little passage from Deuteronomy just so that you can hear what the law, how the law would have been stated. Uh, if brothers dwell together, which is something they didn't bring up, the Sadducees, by the way, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to, up to the gate to the elders and say, My brother's husband, or excuse me, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her. Now listen to this. Then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house, and the name of his house shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) I like that. So it was, it, you know. So when they, so when these folks come up to him and they and they started talking about this, you know, they, you know, it was something that was serious. But they came up with this really weird thing, you know, all seven folks and all of that. Well, so, so Jesus, again, when we when we look at what Jesus does here, and 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 in good rabbinical style, Jesus uses a counter question to answer. Have y'all noticed that? That they come up and they ask him a question. He goes, I'll ask you a question. You know, that, that was a typical rabbinical style for, for, for that type of debate. Now, let, let's, let's take a look at this, verse 24, what Jesus' response was. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? Whoa. Jesus is not pulling any punches here. Think about this. Imagine you got a, a master electrician or a master plumber, 
Somebody that's been in the trade 40, 50 years has wired or plumbed everything that you can possibly imagine. They know the trade, right? I mean, we, we, we can affirm that, that these folks would know what they were talking about, right? So I'm not one of those. And I would walk up to one of these master electricians or master plumbers and say, is this your problem, that you don't know anything about plumbing houses or electrical? I mean, that's what, that's what Jesus said. He went up to these people that were experts in the Torah, experts. They know the Scripture well. And, the, and he's saying, isn't this your problem? You don't know the Scriptures? nor the power of God. They don't, they don't understand. They've not experienced the power of God. So, again, you know, going to your, your plumber, hey, you don't know anything about plumbing. Have you never experienced water leaking? <laughs> I don't know. you got to make up your own, you know, conjure your own image in your mind there. But, but, but these guys were experts. Again, we got to remember. And, and Jesus is stating that they had not experienced or understood the power of God in their life. In other words, they had a very limited or no true relationship with God. And that's, that's important for us to pick up on. These, these are two important points that we're going to come back to in just a moment. So then Jesus goes on to teach them. And, and again, I want you to notice how he taught. Remember, you know, everybody that Jesus has been teaching, they were amazed. They marveled at the way he taught. And the reason they marveled at the way he taught is because he taught with his own authority. You know, Jesus would come up here and he wouldn't, he'd cite himself. You know, I have to cite, you know, commentators. Or I have to cite the scripture. and all. Jesus didn't do that. He spoke from his own authorities. And this is what he does here. So, so, so look at this. This is his answer to them after, after his, his pointing out their error. Mark 25, or 12, 25 through 27. And he goes on to teach him. He goes, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So this word quite wrong and the word error is, is, is plana. It's the word we get planet from, and what it really means is you're way off base. You're just wandering completely off the path here. You're, 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 you're not even in the right vicinity. You're not even close to being accurate. You're quite, quite wrong. And if you also notice, pick up that he, that he talked about the book of Moses, which would have been in the Torah. So, so, so these guys thought they were going to trap Jesus. And here's Jesus. It's like, okay, is your problem that you just don't know Scripture, nor the power of God? I'll go ahead and instruct you. And I will instruct you from the text that you say is the only authority. G- genius. I mean, he just, ah, oh, you got to. Just got to hang on to that. Just savor that for a moment. But there's some things in here that, that I want you to pick up on. You know, one of the other issues that, that, that he is correcting them on, and the Pharisees had the same issues, is that they, they, they kind of thought that, that heaven would be like an extension of life on earth and that marriages would continue on into, into heaven. Now, you know, some of us would really like to be married to the same person in heaven, and some of us might not. I don't know. <laughs> but nevertheless, we won't be married in, 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 in heaven. That doesn't mean that we won't have a relationship. I don't really know how all that plays out, but, but, but I, I know that, that we'll be able to you know, see one another. We'll be able to interact with one another. Again, how exactly that plays out, we, you know, Scripture tells us that we really have absolutely no idea what it's going to be like up there, except that there's going to be no tears, no sorrow, no pain, you know, no sin. You know, that, that right there is like, well, heaven. You know, I mean, wouldn't that be good? So he's telling them that, and, and that wouldn't have made some of the Jewish, other Jewish leaders happy because he kind of is debunking some of their error as well. 
James Edwards writes it this way. He says, here Jesus is stating that one error that they have in their challenge is the wrong assumption that heaven will be an extension of life on earth. Another, another uh, statement from the same commentator is the resurrected life is not a prolonged earthly life, but a life in an entirely new dimension. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 40 through 44, if you want to take a look at that uh, at some time. Now, again, Jesus hits them with this text from the Torah by using a quote from Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 6. <clears throat> So, so I want to I want to explore that just a little bit because it's important for us to pick up on this. Uh, you know, so he he says here uh, in verse twenty six, he says, "As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob.'" You know, uh, in Genesis three, this is where we find Moses encountering the the burning bush episode. Y'all know about the burning bush episode where he goes up on Mount Sinai and, and, and God is calling Moses that he's, you know, to go out there and, and, and free the, 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 the slaves, you know, that, that's in Egypt. And, and Moses is having all kinds of trouble up there too with it. You know, he's like, who am I to do this? You know, you know, who am I to go? And then the, the you know, this unbelievable statement of I am, you tell him I am sent you. What a, what genius again. You know, because us humans, we would, try to, we would try to make something up. Jesus is like, no, man, you know, God's like, I, I am what you need. I am all that you need. And no matter what you come up with, I am the source of everything. I am. You know, I am. You know, what a statement. But when Jesus is talking about this and on the burning bush, note the, note the way in which it, you know, God talks about this, the, the present tense. He goes, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. I am, you know, he's, he's implying here that these folks are still alive. He's, they're still alive. They had to have been resurrected because these folks had been dead for a long time. But this point, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting when you think about it. This is not something that, that, we, that we pick up on very much. Beale and Carson on this passage, it's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it's too good. I'm just going to read the quote to you. It's out of the commentary of the New Testament use of the Old Testament regarding this passage in this verse. Jesus' reference to Exodus 3.6 uniquely grounds his argument not only in Torah, but also in the one place where God himself uttered this self-designation. And in the context of this powerful Exodus redemption of Israel, at issue then is not the phrase itself, but rather the nature of God who uttered it. The nature of God who uttered it. You know, when Jesus was challenging these Sadducees, not only was he saying you don't understand Scripture, but you, are, you haven't experienced the nature of the power of God. You don't understand who this is. We've got to start getting glimpses in our life and living this out of who he is. They, 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 they go on to write this. And in the context of Exodus 3, this means the character and power of the self-sustaining I am. Hear this. Who is the source of creation's order and life, the pinnacle of which is humanity made in his image. I'm going to read that again. In the context of Exodus 3, this means the character and power of the self-sustaining I am. God didn't need anything else to create this world. God doesn't need anything else to send his son down to die for you on the cross. He is the I am. Who is the source of creation's order and life. He is the source. 
Jesus, Jesus is the one by whom all things were made for and through all things were made, and by him all things are being held together. This is who he is. This is who he is. And every human being that ever walked this earth, and sometimes this is hard to, it's hard to reconcile, has been made in the image of God. And because of that, every single solitary human being on the earth has, has the right through what God did to be treated with dignity and respect. I think we could use a little bit of that in this world. What do you think? How social is social media? Man, you say the wrong thing there. Ooh, you need to go to ER, and Joe's going to have to come in like 10 wounds because you're, gonna be a, you're just going to get tore up. You know, have, have, a, have a different political point of view. Bring up that you're a Christian. Stand up for your faith in the workplace. See what happens. He is the pinnacle of which is humanity made in the image of. And then he declares, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So, if, he, if this is true, if he is the God of the living, if he is the great I am, if Jesus came and died for us on the cross, if Jesus rose again, if Jesus is omniscient, if Jesus is who he says he is, if all of this is true, and we affirm that we believe that it is true, here's the hard stuff, y'all. Tom brought it up. Is that what you represent when you walk out the doors? You know, the idea of being holy, sanctified, that means to be set apart. Joe talked about this. In the first century church, the thing that drew people there was the differences that they saw. It was the differences. Women came by groves because they saw a difference in the dignity that they were treated as opposed to the way culture treated them. People came in droves because they saw the love that was being shared within these communities. It was Christians that stayed when we had all of these major plagues, when everybody else was fleeing. It was Christians that stayed to the detriment of their own life at times to help nurse people through in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, demonstrating his compassion. You know, if you're going to stay in a plague because you feel that God is calling you to do that, you better have some pretty strong beliefs. You better have some strong beliefs. So we can see Again, from this interaction that Jesus once again wins the challenge against the leading religious authorities, demonstrating his sovereign authority. That's another thing that we, we, we have. I'm talking about a people group now, all of us, me included, this idea of sovereignty. You know, I want Jesus to be in charge until I want to be in charge. You know, I want to do it God's way until it conflicts with the way I think I should do it. <laughs> if y'all can identify, I hope, I hope you're hearing me. But let's go back. Let's go back to verse 24 because, because I think that in all of this, this is where we really need to lock in. This is where we really need to lock in right here. Because this was the error that, that, he, that he called out to the Sadducees. Jesus said to them, verse 24, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. James Brook writes this in the New American Commentary. He says, Note well the two errors Jesus pointed out, not knowing the content and or proper interpretation of their own scriptures, 
and not having personally experienced the power of God in their lives. He goes on to write, Christian readers need to realize that such deficiencies are not limited to Sadducees or other Jews. Here's some more statistics for you. Approximately 68% of all children raised in the church leave the church within five years and not come back. Take a, take a group of 10 kids. About seven of them won't come back. This again, I got these statistics from that same study. Here's some more really fun ones. People under the age of 35 with no religious affiliation has grown to the highest percentage in our, custom, or in our country's history. 25 to 30 percent of those in our country under the age of 35 have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Chip Ingram brings up Generation Z, this current generation coming up right now. What's going to happen to them if 30% have no idea anything about Christ at all? Well, it gets much rosier. So I'm going to read some more of this. Yesterday, again, this is out of we, why I believe, yesterday the church and the culture shared a general knowledge of the Bible. Today, both the church and the, and the world are biblically illiterate. Yesterday, committed Christian men or women were admired. Today, committed Christian men or women have been called dangerous. Yesterday, we could begin with the truth and then express grace. Today, we must begin with grace in order to share truth. Yesterday, the moral climate and the values of major institutions like education, medicine, and the media reinforced our values, our Christian worldview. Today, the moral climate of major institutions challenge and ridicule our faith. The reality is, is that Christianity has become so marginalized in our country that no one even bothers to consider whether or not they're going to offend a Christian. Because the church, they don't care. They don't care. They don't know. They don't understand. They haven't been taught. People that walk, and I'm, look, you know, I'm talking to myself here also. People that claim to be Christians don't walk out the truth that they believe. We shrink when we're confronted about our faith. We're afraid to praise God in public. We're afraid to acknowledge that our faith is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. We're afraid to say that there is no other way other than Christ because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody. Praise God. What we don't want is for Jesus to look at us or anybody else and say, isn't this your error? Isn't this why you're wrong? You don't know Scripture. You don't have relationship with the Lord. You know, if you're, I, I listened to another thing from Chip Ingram. You know, one of the reasons why we have community is so that we can learn with one another so that we can love one another, so we can be transformed. Do you realize that it's your community that, that God uses to transform you? How do you hold accountable if you don't come to church, if you don't interact, if you don't have Christian fellowship, if your fellowship is only with the world? How are you going to be doing anything any different? What is the difference? That young girl... The team can start coming up. That young girl 
that Chip Ingram was talking about. I'm just going to satisfy my own concern in this and just say she just didn't understand what she was saying. But what a statement that before I'm going to offend my friend, I'm going to deny Christ. Before I take a stand in love, you don't have to lose relationship over this. You can take a stand in love. You can be compassionate. I would rather go to hell than do that. And I understand. I understand the persecution is mounting in the United States. And don't think it's going to get any better. I read an article from California that the state legislature made a resolution that pastors must embrace the LGBTQ lifestyle. It's only it's 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 coming. Our first amendment will only stand so much longer. And then we're going to be dealing with stuff like what Dave deals with over in the Middle East. This is true. He that is in you, if you have trusted in Christ, is greater than he is in the world. If God is for you, you don't have to worry about this. You have nothing to fear. I know this is kind of scary. I know this is kind of scary, but listen, this is real stuff. This is real. I'm just being real, all right? We all know it. We all look out there. We just had somebody kill themselves, and a bunch of kids found them over there in Duluth just the other day. We know it. We live in the real world. We look around. We see it. We see the brokenness. We see the people that are lost. This, I, y'all know I'm telling you the truth on this. I'm not making this up. This isn't just a scare tactic. You know it. You know it. There's one place, not not that you're not going to have troubles, but there's only one place that you can go to find true freedom if you're struggling with something. There's only one place that you can find true solace. There's only one place that you can go, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ. There's one person, there's one person that says, if you knock, the door will be opened. If you seek, then you'll find. If you ask, it will be given. One person has said, listen, in all this world, probably everybody you meet in some way or another wants something from you. You know what he wants? He just wants you. So much so that he came, and we're studying about right now, he came and he, and he became human. He became his creation. You get this? God came down, became his creation. So he could teach us, so that he could live a life that would be an example for us, so that he could be our high priest, and then so he could die for us. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. And you know what, you know what, you know what he said? In order for you to get, in order for you to get salvation, in order for you to get eternal life, do you know what he said? Believe in me. He said, it's by grace. It's by grace you are saved. Y'all know what grace is? It's you get something even if you don't deserve it. It's by grace you are saved through faith. Faith is trust. Faith isn't I got to have everything figured out. I got a problem with that, y'all. I'll be honest. I, I'm one of those kinds of people I got to figure it all out. I gotta, it, it just drives me crazy and my wife crazy. You know? I, you know what I got to figure out? That Jesus Christ came and died for me. And then i got to figure out through studying his word and living and being with folks like y'all that hold me accountable, how can I live for him? How can I continue to surrender my life to him? How can I be an example to others so that they can come? Let me tell you, there's, there's a big difference between the guy you see up here and the guy that was 30 years ago. And the guy that was 30 years ago wanted to be a good guy. But he didn't have the power to change some of the idiocy, some of the world living that he was in. You know what changed my life? Jesus Christ came in. 
That's what changes it. And that's what can change your life too. You do not have the power to change on yourself. Only God can do that. Period. You don't need to fix yourself to come to him. Come to him and he'll start working you out. He'll start sanctifying you. He'll start changing you from the inside out. Suddenly, suddenly you're going to be able to lay that thing, whatever it is, down. You don't have to work a lick because it's not of works lest anyone should boast. It is a gift of God. It's not of yourselves. You all hearing me? Now listen, all of this stuff, all of this bad news stuff that I, that I, that I gave you, all, this is just reality, y'all. This is just a life. This is just a world screaming out for Christ. It's just, it's just desperate people doing everything they can to be able to make it by. You have the key for them. You, God is making your appeal, his appeal through you. You, you, if you just get a hold of this for a second, you will never in your life ever have to worry about what is my purpose and why am I here. You are here to declare the glory of God. And if you haven't accepted Christ now, let me tell you, you're walking a lonely life. You're walking a lonely life. And all of these people and all of these self-help things and all of the stuff going on there, all of the booze and all of the sex and all of the drugs and all of the other stuff that's promising, all of this stuff, all of the workout fads, all of the different cars, all of the, all of the clothes and the, all of that stuff that we're inundated with, 24 hours a day, seven days a week won't give you anything, nothing but heartache and debt. Jesus Christ can give you life. And not just life, but life more abundant. He wants you to have his joy in you. You hear what I'm saying? And you don't have to work a lick for this. Now, there's work to do, but not for this. Y'all hearing me? This is good news, y'all. You don't have to be afraid of any of those things that I talked about, but you need to be moved by them. We need to step out there and understand that this is real. It's real. We don't need any other 15-year-old girls out there thinking that to deny Christ is the right move. We're going to sing that song that we sang just a little while ago that I love Jesus and I hope, I hope that as we get ready to close out here that we that we that we can get a glimpse of what that means